Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night prayer meeting Bible study. <laughs> We're going to start off with a scripture reading. <clears throat> Psalms 100, a psalm of thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing, knowing that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and that we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him, and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. May the Lord bless the hearing and reading of his word. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you once again uh, to be able to come and to assemble together, to be of like minds and like hearts, to be intercessors for many who aren't present here tonight. We pray that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide us and that all will be done in edification of you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Prayer request. There another? Yeah, Tom. My wife, Leah, is sick with immigration and going to Spain in September. Is there another? Is there another? Well, <clears throat> on last Thursday, I had the opportunity to go visit with Karen um, Ingram. She's someone who had been a part of Only Baptist Church back in the early 2000s, um, <clears throat> around 2006. She and her sister, Andrea, um, left to open up a daycare center in Tacoma Park, a children's nursery. And <clears throat> that business was flourishing until COVID hit. And <clears throat> when COVID hit, they had to close the daycare center. Um, Karen was battling with cancer. She had gone through chemo and other treatment. And um, she was placed on hospice. On Sunday, she passed away. She went to be with the Lord. But her sister, Andrea, is a woman of faith, um, very encouraging to be there with her sister. Um, I'm a little saddened. I'm still trying to get over it. But I want to lift her up, her, Andrea, up tonight as well. That God gives her strength um, at this time. The uh, memorial service is tentatively scheduled for April 18th. I'm going to pencil that in. Um, but Andrea's faith uh, is held dead strong up to the very end. Karen's faith strong. Yeah. Is there another? Let us go to the Lord and pray. 
Father God, we join in hearts and minds as we lift up Barbara Irving tonight. Father God, you know her condition. We pray for her husband, Rick, um, to strengthen him. Um, we pray for her full recovery, to see her back with us once again. We lift up Bria, the stepchildren who uh, travel to Spain. We pray for travel mercies, that all will go well, and there will be a time of refreshing. We thank you for Joel and being back home with family and friends. We pray for his continued healing and health. We pray for Elsie and the children who are traveling, that you would grant them travel mercies. We lift up Andrea tonight, Father God, um, to lose one sister. Um, it's very painful, but she's a woman of faith. And we pray, Father God, that you would comfort her and meet all of her needs according to your riches and glory. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, can you turn to Philippians, please? Uh, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1. Um, there's little that I could add to what Charles just said, but um, Andrea did ask me to share with you all uh, her thanks for all of your uh, prayers uh, during this time. So in Philippians 1, we're going to look in verses 19 through 26. Uh, and how many of you, when you were a kid, played with magnifying glasses? Okay, how many of you played with magnifying glasses when you were not a kid? <laughs> um, so, and how many of you would set pieces of paper on fire with a magnifying glass? Okay, all right. So, um, a magnifying glass uh, magnifies. Um, and so, here's the question that we have to ask ourselves. What kind of a magnifying glass are you? You know, what, what do you magnify? Um, you know, some people, uh, everyone has pet peeves. Everyone has certain things and certain personality traits and certain interests and certain things that we're known for. So what do you magnify in your life? You know, what, what do people associate with you? And I think that's a good question for us to hang in our minds as we look at what Paul says here in the passage that we're going to look at. So in Philippians uh, 1, we're going to focus tonight. We started looking at these verses last week. We're going to focus, zero in on verses 19 to uh, 26. For I know, Paul writes, Philippians 1, verse 19, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ uh, by my coming to you again. So there's several things that I want to really zero tonight in on as we look at this passage. Um, sorry about that. I'm trying to, uh, to balance everything on a small uh, podium top here. Thank you. Um, so the first thing we want to look at is, uh, Paul, thank you so much, is a, a review of Paul's uh, purpose. Paul's purpose. Um, and I'd like to ask, you know, are we clear on our purpose? You know, why, have, you ever, have you ever just stopped for a second and just asked, why am I here? I mean, you know, there was a time when you weren't here. 
There, 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 a lot, a lot. Remember, my pastor was telling me when I was a kid one time. You know, Brian, a lot of stuff happened before you came along. And you know, as a kid, I'm like, well, obviously nothing important happened you know, <laughs> before I came along, right? You know, so I mean, but a lot of things happened before we came along. Uh, which means those things happen without our assistance and without our involvement. So a lot of stuff takes place even now in the world without our assistance and without our involvement. A lot of stuff happens to us that's not necessarily in our control and due to our involvement, right? Um, and so when you really think about it, I mean, to my knowledge, has, has the president any president ever called you and asked your advice on the decisions that you make? Okay, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in Washington, D.C. that they don't really consult us on. So there's a lot of things that take place now and that take place in the past that you and I have no involvement with. And so I want to ask you, have you ever stopped to really contemplate that and I'm not trying to depress you when I, when I say this, but when you consider all the things that happen that you and I have nothing to do with, have you ever asked yourself, well, then why am I here? Why am I here? Why do I exist? Now, the world will tell you, and they do tell you this, that you basically exist by accident, and the only meaning that you have is the meaning that you give yourself or that the people in your life give you. That's essentially the message from the world. If you don't believe me, come talk to me. I'll send you some stuff where they basically say that. We are accidents of nature. We just happen to be uh, where evolution has brought us to this point. And, uh, and meaning, well, meaning is something that you have to decide for yourself what your meaning is. Well, if that's the case, that, is not, that does not provide hope, really, when you analyze that and think about it. Uh, I, I could really depress you if I wanted to right now. But there is an essay written by a philosopher named William Lane Craig. I know Adelso knows who I'm talking about. Uh, he's a fellow apologist on the Christian faith. And um, William Lane Craig wrote a, a piece called The Absurdity of... of, um, of uh, life without God. And basically, he just analyzes, let's look at this logically. If there is no God, then what is the meaning and purpose of life? And he just logically explores that, because he's a philosopher. He just logically, let's look at this. What's the meaning and purpose of life? Well, and, the, and, the, and the, the end of the conclusion of that is, there is no meaning. And, and, and you might try to challenge that, but when you think about it, all of us, if, if, let's just pretend for a second that there's no God. And again, I don't believe that, okay? But let's pretend for a moment there is no God. All of us are going to cease to exist. This world is going to cease to exist. The universe is going to cease to exist. And no one will be around to remember any of us. So what is the meaning then? Yes, Ronnie.
Yeah. Why now? Yeah. Yeah. It is, and it, it's like if you can start chasing this out, and, and I've done it, I mean, over the course of my life, too, uh, just thinking it through, why am I here, and why am I here now? And Because I have no control over that. I have no control over my parents getting together. I didn't pick my parents. I love my parents. I'm great, glad that I have, but I didn't pick them. It wasn't like there was this assembly line, which parents would you like? Okay, you know, and that just didn't work that way. So I, uh, and, and, and those of you that are parents, you didn't pick your kids when you get right down to it. I want you to think about that for a second. You know, we're all adults, right? So you had, you had sex, you had kids that came out of that sexual intimacy, with, hopefully with your spouse, but you didn't pick them. They did, there wasn't this like, uh, this program you type in, you know, like when you play The Sims or something, you can like design you know, I want, nah, I'm going to put some more weight on that person. No, make them taller. Make, you know, yeah, blonde hair, blue hair, you know, whatever. You know, you can't do any of that when it comes to your kids. And, and, and so there, you, you, don't, you don't, I just want you to understand how little control you have when it comes to reality. And so when you consider that we live in this sea of reality and how little control we have and how little of consequence we are to it because i could i could name you people like lincoln and dr king and others who seem to have major impacts and they did compared to us they did and i'm all for heroes and everything but in the grand scheme of things when you consider that the human race has been around recorded history for several thousand years you know, and then if we're all going to die and we're all going to cease to exist, then what then? There's no one, no one's going to be around to remember us. So when you really chase this out and really analyze this, there is only one answer. There is only one ob objective means by which we can have value. And that's if we're not an accident. But if we were intentionally created by someone who is eternal and all-knowing, God has the attributes necessary to give us all meaning. You ever contemplate that? It's like God is all-knowing. That means he never forgets anything I do and anything you do. Now, that can be good or bad, right? But, you know, but just understand, God has perfect memory and God is everywhere present, so God notices everything. Unlike me, I failed to notice that Jimmy, I told him I was going to address this tonight. Um, Jimmy, Jimmy actually replaced the thresholds as you come into the auditorium and as you come into the, and the, the, the foyer area there and stuff, which have needed to be replaced for a long time. And he replaced them, and I didn't notice them. <laughs> And so I just want to publicly thank Jimmy for that, okay, for doing that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I almost got uninvited to lunch with Jimmy because of that. So I, uh, so, but, you know, I also should say that uh, Jimmy and Alex uh, worked really hard to bring the chairs and tables in that Jane ordered. You know, the church approved at the last business meeting. So if you get a chance, you can go back and check out the new, they're comfortable too. Uh, new new folding chairs and stuff. But anyway, um, what's that? Oh, Eric, Erica helped too. I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and it did. so I'm not observant on things. Okay, so uh, I can miss stuff. All right, and 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 you know, it, seriously, he's teasing me about it. And it's all good. But I mean, you can understand that when you work hard and people don't notice, it starts to affect how you feel about yourself because you did all this work and people didn't notice. But that's because you're basing your self-worth and self-esteem and value on what people think and what people notice, which is a bad deal, all right? But if you understand that God notices everything because he's all-knowing and everywhere present, he sees everything, now that's a whole different ballgame. Do you get it? All right, and then when you understand that God keeps the ultimate score, so he's the one that determines what's important and what's not important. It's not your values or my values, it's his values. It's not your truth, my truth, it's his truth. 
because he is truth. Now you understand, okay, my meaning, my purpose, my whole reason for being logically should be rooted in God and not in myself and not in other people. I hope you understand this, how this makes sense. This isn't just Bible talk. Not that the Bible ought to be sufficient. The Bible ought to be good enough, okay? But that being said, some people might need a little more convincing, so I'm just using logic here with you. Basic logic. If you don't have God, what do you have? You know, yes. If God is not a part of your life, you're missing the most important thing to have in your life. You're missing the whole purpose for your life. So Paul, the entire purpose here is, hey, I'm here to serve God. And so Paul's writing this from under arrest, being under arrest. Again, I can, um, I've done a study on Paul's life and stuff. Some of you have done that too. And and if you look at his two years in Rome that he was in, it went into, he was in different, sometimes he was under you know, very uh, rough imprisonment, and sometimes he was in the highest arrest, so it kind of went all over the place. But nevertheless, he was in captivity. And yet he's like, hey, I'm here right now because this is where God wants me. This is where God wants me. And I've got a job to do. This, This is foundational to everything. Whatever you're going through in life, have you ever stopped to ask yourself, what does God want from me? So Paul's purpose is found in verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So my purpose is Christ. That is why I'm here. I'm here for Jesus. So question for you, why are you here? And, and, and the true um, answer to really, when it gets right down to it, big picture, you got to be able to say authentically and genuinely, you're here for Jesus. You're here for Christ. And if Christ wants me here for 54 years or 57 years like our sister Karen or 101 years like our sister Elsie from a few years ago, whatever Christ wants, Christ gets because I'm here for Christ. And it's hard for us to say that, but that's what, that's what, the, that's what it comes down to. So... Um, now, how do you, okay, you might be thinking, well, that sounds great intellectually and in the abstract, but how do you feel that? How, do, how does that get down in you? Well, remember, we started out asking about magnifying glasses. So what do you magnify in your mind? What do you magnify in your thoughts? What do you focus on? Your focus will influence your feelings. What you focus on will determine how you feel about your life. Um, you can focus on the things that are wrong in your life, and if you focus on everything that's bad and wrong and uncomfortable and painful and difficult, then guess what? Your whole mindset is going to be driven by all the challenges and obstacles and difficulties in your life. Or you can focus on the things that mean the most in your life. Focus on your relationships, especially your relationship with God. Then your life has a whole different meaning to it. And so Paul is like, hey, I want to magnify Christ So look again in the first few verses we started with today, because this is all fundamental here. For I know that this will, this was referring to him being in captivity, captivity, excuse me. This will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. In other words, whether I'm living or whether I die, Christ will be magnified. And I expect that to happen. Because that's really uh, the control that you have. You get to choose who you live for. That's your, that's your control. You don't get to decide or determine everything that happens to you, but you do get to choose who you live for. And Paul decided that he was going to make his life about Christ, and so Christ was going to be magnified whether he was dying or whether he was living. And that really is, is the lesson here from this whole, this whole passage. So is Christ magnified in your life? 
Is he, is he magnified in your thoughts and is he magnified in your testimony with what other people see in you? Um, I've said this many times, uh, telling on my dad, um, but, um, you know, my dad had uh, the uh, fish bumper sticker on his car, you know, and he also had a bumper sticker that said, Jesus saves. And yet, he didn't always remember that when he was out driving. <laughs> and so he would uh, cut people off and honk at people and stuff. And I was in the car uh, watching this as he would do these things, you know. And then he would, like, realize, oh, <laughs> And he actually wrote an article on it, about that and sent it to a Christian magazine telling on himself for it, you know, because, you know, you, do you magnify Christ in how you drive? Do you magnify Christ in how you treat people at work? Do you magnify Christ in how you talk politics? Do you magnify Christ in how you deal with differences? Do you magnify Christ when you are with other people uh, and how you treat other people and how you interact with other people, you know. And the answer to that isn't just in your own mind. It's just truly, would Jesus be pleased with how you conduct yourself? You know, it's like, as a representative of Jesus, would Jesus be happy with how you represent him? Uh, and so it's convicting for all of us to reflect on this. But um, so now in a practical sense, though, I know tempting for some of you that might be thinking, well, okay, that's all fine, but I'm in pain. I'm hurting. I'm worried. What do I do? Okay. Look at what Paul says in 19 and 20 on a practical sense. Paul says, um, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. All right. So Paul is thanking the Philippian church for their prayers. So practically speaking, when you have worries in your mind and heart, when you are upset about things, the first thing you need to do is pray. And then you should ask your brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for you. Prayer is powerful. Prayer still works. It, it, and, and Paul is expressing faith and confidence here because he knows this church is praying for him. And... Um, and now, the, 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 the thing that's often on our minds is, what if it doesn't work out the way that we want it to, or the way that we're praying? And we're going to look at that, because I'm going to contrast this passage with 2 Timothy in just a moment. Because in 2 Timothy, Paul is approaching the end of his life, and he knows it. And his confidence is different in 2 Timothy. Here in Philippians, he's confident that he's basically, he's basically saying, I'm confident that I'm going to be hanging around for a little while longer. That's the gist of it. When you read the whole passage, he's saying, I'm confident that God's going to keep me here because I've still got more work to do. And I, I, need, I need to serve you all and help you all. And I know that. And so I'm confident that I'm going to get through this. That's not his confidence in 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, he's about to be put to death and he knows it. So, but, I want, but we're going to look at that passage in just a second because even if we die, it doesn't mean God has failed us. Because look at, again, Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do we really believe that, though? All right, so this is like, you know, Sunday morning... It's me preaching, you receiving. Wednesday night we can talk. All right? Um, do we really believe it? I mean, I, do we really believe that Karen Anglin was promoted? And we can be sad, but is Karen sad right now? And do we really believe that? Are we confident about that? Because if we're not, we're kind of wasting our time here. This is what the hope is. It's like, and Paul in 2 Timothy um, is expressing, he knows he's approaching the end, but he is confident. I have fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So his confidence is different, but he's still confident. He's not confident that he's going to survive what the Romans are going to do to him, but he's confident that he's got rewards in heaven, and he's heading to heaven. And that is a win for Paul. That's a promotion for him. 
and, and I just really want this to sink in for everyone here. This has got to sink in. This is where the rubber meets the road when it comes to faith. This has to sink in. If you die, if you're a Christian, I should, that's an important one. If you're a Christian and you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you've got a relationship with him and you die, that is a promotion. That is a gain. That is a win. That is not a loss. And Paul knows that. At the same time, Paul has, um, and again, that, that's, it's important from an orientation standpoint. You ever been lost? Ever been lost? Anyone been lost? Just, or just me? All right. So you ever get lost in the city? And you walk up, okay, now we got cell phones now with uh, GPS and stuff. <laughs> they don't always work. But do you remember the days when we didn't have GPS? Remember those days? It wasn't that long ago, right? We didn't have a cell phone to rely on, okay? And you get lost in the city, and you're like, I have no idea where I am. Now, if you don't know where you are, it's really hard to find where you're supposed to be. I remember got, getting lost down there in the city one time, and I called Jane, and I'm like, I'm lost. She's like, where are you? And I'm like, if I knew that, I wouldn't be lost. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and, so I, and so I'm driving all around, and I get, to one, I get to some parts of D.C. that aren't exactly Christian-friendly. Oh, okay. You know, there are certain ladies working the streets, you know, <laughs> And they're not hanging, handing out gospel tracts, you know, and stuff. <laughs> and they're around, and I'm going to do, and I look over, it's 14th Street. I'm like, oh, okay. And, I, and, and, I, and I'm, see, they're whistling at me and stuff. And I'm like, I am not down here for this. Um, and so I was totally, totally lost, okay? So, yes, Ronnie? Okay. <laughs> and uh, so I, um, I uh, yeah, I got out of there. But anyway, the point is, it's like I, I, had to, I had to orient myself and tell Jane some street numbers so then she could look on the map. This was the, before cell phones. We actually had to pay for ma maps and stuff, you know. She had to look on the map and guide me out of the city. And so the reason I say that illustration, and I'll get Ronnie's comment, is that you have to know where you are and where you're headed as you go through this life otherwise you're going to feel lost yeah. so you got to know where you are this gets to the questions of why are you here what's your purpose okay you know those maps that you see in the city where it's got the big finger you are here okay all right that's what paul is doing here in philippians 1 it's like you're here because jesus wants you here and your purpose is to glorify and magnify him in whatever situation or state that you're in. That's the fundamentals. We can get to the details later. Like, does, does, does the Lord want to magnify you as a bricklayer or as a pastor or a teacher or a counselor or, or whatever, occupation, pick whatever, uh, doctor, nurse, whatever. Or does the Lord uh, want to, you know, what, does the Lord want you to have a family, have children, have grandkids? We can get to the details later. But the foundation, the fundamentals, whether you're a man or woman, whatever you are, rich, poor, black, white, whatever, it doesn't matter. What the bottom line is, you're here to glorify Jesus Christ. That's the fundamental. That's the, and that is your whole purpose, is to glorify God. And so the details can be worked out later. Um, but if you're lost and you don't know where you are or why you're here, you're not even going to know how to approach those details. I mean, think about it. You're not even going to know how to ask God, what occupation should I be? Because you're not even going to know to ask him. So you got to get clear on where you are and where you're headed. And where you're headed is the finish line. And we're going to get to this later in Philippians because Paul addresses this later in Philippians. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's where we're headed. And, and we don't know how long it's going to take us to get there. But, you know, when Paul had his head chopped off by the Romans and Paul wakes up in the presence of Jesus, do you think Paul was sad and disappointed and upset? Paul was rejoicing. And one of the coolest uh, uh, memes that I've seen going around is it's like when Paul gets to heaven and meets Stephen, who Paul had a hand in killing, there was rejoicing in heaven. 
Because Stephen had no bitterness. Just forgiveness. And just a welcome brother. That's where we're headed. And all the petty nonsense that takes place in this life and all the division and all the hate, none of this matters. It's all the distraction from the enemy. So, Ronnie, you had a comment back when I was talking about 14th Street in D.C. I'm sorry, was there any? I just wanted to... <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so. <laughs> okay, that's assuming that I know what I'm doing, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I would say it's like, for me, it's just when there's lots of traffic and there's one way streets, I don't anticipate and things like that, it gets real confusing. But yeah, different people are comfortable in different areas. Yeah. So, but it's. <laughs> no, I, well, I didn't know where to stop. There was no good place to stop. Yes, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. So you drove down to the city to get lost, to see to find... Right. Well, there are other ways to, for recreation and stuff. So that's like, uh, I, uh, so, uh, everyone has their own entertainment. So, so, uh, <laughs> um, so <laughs> all right. So we'll get back to, I'm um, thinking that, that um, Paul, <laughs> you walked into that, man. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Paul had an expectation, too, of supply and provision. He says um, the Greek term here actually re means supply and provision. So, um, he is being supplied by the prayers and by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And so, the Spirit of Jesus Christ refers to the Holy Spirit because it was Christ who sent the Holy Spirit. You know, if you see the, uh, read that in John 14. Um, and so he, he's recognizing that the Holy Spirit has provided for me. So this is an important one because a lot of times we feel like we're in this alone. Have you ever felt alone? Because the only thing worse being lost is being lost and alone. Because if you're, if you're lost with someone, at least you can, you know, commiserate together about it, right? Or, you know, talk to each other. You got someone. That, but if you're lost and you're by yourself, you're isolated. Not only that, but... Um, we've got a uh, Korean War veteran, two Vietnam veterans, any other veterans here tonight? Uh, so uh, these guys can tell you that in the military, communication is essential. And so you don't want to have a situation where you're surrounded by the enemy and cut off from all communication. Because if that is the case, then you're cut off from supplies, you're cut off from communication, and then you really are in trouble. Well, guess what the devil tries to do to us? In spiritual warfare, the devil will try to cut you off, isolate you, get you away from, from God's people, get you away from church, get you away from the Bible, isolate you, make you alone, and then he can surround you. And um, so Paul is confident in the prayers of God's people, and he's confident that the Holy Spirit is supplying him and providing for him. So you're like, well, how is the Holy Spirit providing for him if he's in prison? So let's just, let's just tackle this for a second. I'll read between the lines a little bit here, but just imagine you're Paul. You're in captivity. How could the Holy Spirit provide for you and supply your needs without just liberating you from prison? Ronnie. Inner peace. Inner peace. Okay. Erica. Yeah. So inner peace, people, connection, faith, okay, very good. Strengthening the faith to, to trust in, in the Lord, that he's answering prayers. What else? 
And then the stuff, Erica mentioned the stuff, all right? So I want to turn to 2 Timothy in just a second because it, he, he it addresses that. But uh, So Paul is confident that God is providing for him even though he's in prison. And so sometimes if you've been in prison, literally or figuratively, if you've been in prison because of health issues where you feel like claustrophobic and the world is closing around you because your health is literally imprisoning you, your body is imprisoning you, uh, if, you're, if you're in prison because of relationship challenges, if you're in prison because of whatever, God can still supply you even in that situation. There, in, in the Cold War, you all remember the Berlin Airlift, you know? This before my time, but um, I, I've read about it in history books, okay? But the Berlin, uh, West Berlin was, was allied, and, and the Soviets cut off, in the Cold War, the Soviets cut off West Berlin. So they did, a, they did an airlift. They had to drop in supplies into West Berlin so the people wouldn't starve. God can do the same thing to you and me. God can, you may feel like you are in a hopeless situation, but God can drop supplies in to sustain you in that situation. Paul's perspective is that um, it's an opportunity. He's in prison. It's an opportunity to serve Christ. Um, and uh, so he's going to take advantage of that. Uh, and he also realizes, hey, what's the worst the Romans can do to me? Kill me? I win if they kill me. All right. So and then Paul's desires. He has a desire uh, that's kind of torn. On the one hand, he wants to go be with Jesus. And, and I, I, I don't believe, and Paul would agree with this, I think, that we should just be sitting on the rooftop of our church building here and just praying and begging God to take us home. You know, in other words, you don't just give up on life and give up on your responsibilities and be like, just, just come, Jesus, I'm ready kind of thing, okay? But as you're going through life, you need to have the confidence that, hey, if, if I die, okay, great, you know, I'm with the Lord. I close my eyes in this life, I wake up in the next with the Lord. Great, you know. And, and that's not something to be afraid of. It's something to be confident in. And it's something to realize, hey, you know, this is a win for me. This is a good thing, you know. And now, but on the other hand, here's the other side. Paul, listen, this, this is good. Paul is not saying, but I want to stick around because I want to earn more money. And he's not sticking, I want to stick around because I really, really want to go to Disney World one more time. I really want to, and I'm not saying it's wrong to do that stuff, but I'm, that's not his reason for sticking around. It's because he loved the church in Philippi, and he wanted to hang around and encourage them and support them. So the reason why you and I, I think if we're going to take Paul's example, the reason why you and I should desire to stick around is so that we can love the people and serve the people that God has put in our life. So we, 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 we embrace the people, we love them, we have relationships with them, and we want to serve them, and as long as we're here, we're going to do that. But then when the Lord calls us home, we tell them, hey, don't, don't cry for me. It's okay. I'm going to be in a better place. The late Timothy Keller told his family, this is nothing at all. Nothing at all. And he was dying. Paul's, um, so that's desire, Paul's confidence. He's confident that he will, and I want you to see this, verse 25 and 26. He says, and being confident of this, he's being confident of the fact that if he stays, he gets to help them more. I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. In other words, he's like, okay, so I know, based on, based on the Holy Spirit communicating to me, Paul saying that I'm going to stick around, and my coming back to you is going to increase your faith and encourage you, and God wants to do that, and so, and I can help you more and be a part of your lives more, and so I'm confident that I'll get through this. It'll be okay. That's what Paul is saying. All right, it sounds great. But now let's look over at 2 Timothy and look at a different confidence that Paul has. And I think this, this will help 
um, at least it did for me as I was studying this, these passages, help kind of process, well, how do you know when God's going to deliver you and when God's not going to deliver you, and how do you process that emotionally? So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, um, this is a prison epistle. He writes this toward the end of his life. He is in prison, and um, we believe probably in the Mamertine prison at this point. If you've been to Rome, this is a harsh prison. It's still there. And, uh, and so probably he's in Rome in the Mamertine prison. He's writing these words, okay? And so Philippians, excuse me, 2 Timothy 4, we'll start in verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. So different confidence. He's not saying, I know I'm going to be out of here. It's not what he's saying. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who loved his appearing. So Paul now is approaching the end of his life, and he knows it's the end. Now, how do you think he knew it's the end? I, I have talked with some families as I've you know, walked with them through funerals and stuff like that. And this is what uh, um, Andrea told me that Karen said. Because I've, I've had the privilege of being with her quite a bit the last few days. And um, including on Sunday when she passed. But on, on um, Andrea said that Karen told her several weeks ago, this is the year the Lord's going to take me home. Now, I'm not saying that happens in every case. But I have heard Christians tell me that God laid it on their loved one's heart. This is it. This is it. And I can't promise that that's going to be the case for you. I can't promise that God's going to do that for you. I mean, there's no, like, formula, do this and do this, and then, you know, God. Will, but I would say the closer you are to God, the more in communication you are with God. The closer you are with God, the more at peace you are with God. And, and the more at peace you are with God and the closer you are with God, also I would say the more certain you are of what God's plan and purpose is for your life. And so I really believe with all of my heart that Paul realized at this point that he had done everything God called him to do. There wasn't anything left for him to do. So he was at peace with departing this, this life. I've done everything I can. I've answered the call. God has told me all the stuff that I need to do. I've done it. I've finished my course. I've obeyed it. I've done it. I'm ready. Isn't that... That's... The, that's what we all need to be at. Instead of being close to our deathbed, or God forbid, on our deathbed, full of regrets, because we haven't done the things God told us to do. Paul is like, he's not worried at this point. He's not upset about this. He's got, I've done it. I've finished my course. I have kept the faith. And there's a reward for me, and not just for me, but for all those who love his appearing. That's my hope that I will be in that state of mind and in that confidence when I'm at the end. And I hope that's, that's a goal. That's a goal that all of us can aim for and strive for, is to have this confidence. And so right now, you need to be about the Father's business. You need to be, whatever God wants you to do, do it. Run your race. Finish your course. And then when you reach the point where God takes you home, you have no regrets. That's, the, that's what we want to strive for. Um, but Paul does have some human needs even while he is in prison. And it's not him being selfish or him being ungodly. Right here in inspired scripture. This is the human part of Paul that I love to see. So we go on. Be diligent 
to come to me quickly. Now he's writing to Timothy. Timothy is his protege. Uh, Paul is a father figure to Timothy. And, uh, and he wants Timothy with him. Why would he want Timothy with him? Anyone? Okay. But I think there's an emotional thing here. Yeah, he doesn't want to be alone. This is human. This is the human Paul. Not that Paul isn't human at other times. But look, he also says this. I'll, this is powerful. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Now, he doesn't say that Crescens or Titus have deserted him. They just they went and had business to attend to and they left. But Demas... He's forsaken me. Notice that Paul doesn't say, Demas has forsaken the Lord. Even though I think he did, Paul, it's personal for Paul. It hurt him. And guess what? I've talked to some pastors and stuff, and you, meet, you get hurt. And it's like, welcome to ministry. You get hurt. And um, Paul is expressing his hurt here. He's hurt. He's hurt that a guy that he counted on, a guy he considered to be a friend, a partner in ministry, has abandoned him. And so he's writing out, I believe, from his heart to Timothy, please hurry to be with me. I'm approaching the end. I need a friend. That is not sinful. It is not wrong. It is not um, does not reflect poorly on Paul's faith. It's just Paul being human. And, and we need friends to get through this life. We need encouragement and support to get through this life. And it's okay to acknowledge that and say that. So Paul is honest about it. You have something, Jimmy? <laughs> Hospital, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, the COVID was hard on a lot of people for that very reason. I know of spouses that couldn't be with each other in the hospital during critical stuff because of COVID restrictions and things like that. So that was hard on a lot of people. That's the hardest thing I think about the whole disease was the isolation, cutting people off. A lot of people were just cut off from their support. And, uh, and so, yeah, so, so Paul is like, I, I, need, I could use a friend here. And his ultimate trust is in the Lord. And he's confident in the Lord. But there's still the human side there. There's still, the, he, I need a friend. And so don't, you need friends to get through this life. Don't think you can go through this life on your own. And it's great that when we have godly friends that lift us up. Um, he says, only Luke is with me. So this is cool. Uh, right now, he's basically, of all the people in this whole city, uh, only Luke is someone I can count on. Only Luke is here with me. And, and uh, Luke is, of course, the writer of the Gospel of Luke. And then he says, I love this, I almost get choked up every time I read this, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Now, why is that powerful? Any Bible scholars want to tell me why that's a big deal? Yep. So, uh, John, Mark, and Paul had a falling out. As was said, they uh, were um, on a missionary team, and... Uh, uh, Paul, Barnabas, and Mark, and, and Mark left him. They, he left the team in the middle of the missions trip, and Paul didn't, didn't take kindly to that. And so in the book of Acts, it says that when Barnabas and Paul were getting ready to go on another trip, Barnabas said, let's bring Mark, and Paul's like, uh-uh, we're not bringing Mark. And so that was such a big deal that Paul and Barnabas split. 
And they're close friends. They were close missionary brothers and partners. They split. Big deal. And yet, here we are at the end of Paul's life. And Paul says, bring, bring Mark with you. Because he's useful. You can almost imagine, like, in the, in, the, when the, in the original split, he thought Mark was useless. But not now. Yes. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I'll repeat the question in a second. Yeah. 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 That was what I was going to go to. Yeah. Yeah. So the question for those online and those that didn't hear, the question is, at what point does God wipe away all tears? And, and also for the rejoicing that's taking place right now in heaven and just the emotions in general, what's, what's the degree of those emotions right now? So a great question. I've thought about that a lot myself. I think that right now the people who are with the Lord in heaven, and I want to add, I don't believe in soul sleep, so I believe that there is consciousness uh, in the presence of the Lord now. So the people like our sister Joy and others who have passed away, people now like our sister Karen, they're conscious, they're conscious right now in the presence of the Lord. And I believe that they have the full gamut of emotions. And I think that's clear in the passage you mentioned, the the, the martyrs are are beseeching the Lord, when are you going to do justice for us, you know, kind of thing. And that's in Revelation. So I think there is that full range of emotions right now, including like, What's going on here? Even a little bit of impatience, like the uh, the the joy, but also uh, the uh, the the sorrow and all that. Um, but there will come a point. Um, this gets into deep eschatology here, but I do believe it's when, when you have the great white throne of judgment and all that. The very end, right end of Revelation. At that point, God wipes away all tears. So at that at that point, it's like we're eternally. Good to go, you know, so to speak, from that point forward. But I do think there's emotion in heaven now. The difference is that the saints that are with the Lord now don't have their sin nature anymore. So they no longer have the flesh. So there's not that sin nature. And they're directly in the presence of God. So they have comfort from him, you know. But there is emotion there. Yes? Yeah. Time is very different. That's a, that's a hard one to get our minds around, but it's interesting that Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. It's present tense. I am. Before Abraham was, I am. It's, when you really start to think about that, it gets, you know, it gets deep. Um, and we're at 759, so I can't take that too much deeper. Um, but good question. I do think there is, a, there is emotion in heaven, but I also believe there's comfort in heaven um, because, because those, those saints were able to go directly to the throne of God and to directly address God, you know, with their, with their issues. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We see face to face then in heaven. So like now it's, we see through glass darkly, first Corinthians 13. Um, so I'm going to close in prayer, but I just want to, I want just one closing thought here. And that is this, your perspective will be strengthened or weakened your perspective in god will be strengthened and weakened based on what you magnify in your mind and heart and life the more you magnify the lord the more at peace you will be and the more you'll be able to cope with whatever this life throws at you and you know whether you're at the end of your life like paul is in second timothy or whether you still have a few more years to go like paul did in philippians you're still going to be magnifying the lord 
and you're still going to be able to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for um, the fact that we can look to you for our peace and provision. I pray that wherever anyone here is here tonight in their relationship with you, that they will recognize that they need you more than anything else in their life right now. And I pray that they will make a relationship with you their highest priority. And I pray that those of us that have made a decision to give our life to you, I pray that you will comfort us with the knowledge that as long as we keep our eyes on you and keep our, our, our lives rooted in you, that we can have peace and purpose and confidence in you. It's in the name of your son we pray this prayer. Amen. Have a great night, everyone.